This hearing will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recess at any time. Good afternoon, and welcome to today's joint subcommittee hearing on advancing our nation's space weather activities. I'm happy to be here with my colleague, Space and Aeronautics Subcommittee Chairwoman Horn, to discuss the important topic of space weather. The term space weather may not be familiar to everyone, but we are aware of some of its more benign examples, such as the Northern Lights. Space weather describes naturally occurring disturbances in space that are primarily driven by the sun. These variations in the space environment can negatively impact technology in space, such as satellites for weather and GPS, pose health risks to our astronauts, and also affect critical ground-based systems, such as electric grids. Despite knowing the potential for these significant impacts, our ability to forecast space weather events with significant notice is limited at best. Given our society's dependence on many technologies that could be impacted by space weather events, it's critically important that we understand both the physical processes that drive these phenomena and how we can forecast them earlier to allow adequate protection of critical assets. For this, we need to invest in scientific research and sustained observations. NOAA is responsible for the civilian forecasting through the National Weather Service's Space Weather Prediction Center, SWPC. The forecasters and scientists at SWPC collect data and observations from their own network of satellites and work in close partnership with other federal agencies, including NASA, who we have here today, the US Air Force, the National Science Foundation, and the United States Geological Survey, among others. Assets in space provide key data necessary for accurate and timely space weather forecasts. Disruptions in this data due to malfunctions, as we are currently seeing with NOAA's Deep Space Climate Observatory, or Discover Satellite, without a long-term redundancy plan, puts our critical infrastructure in space and on the ground at risk. A recent study contracted by NOAA on customer needs for space weather products and services found that space weather disturbances can impact major sectors of society, including aviation, electric power, navigational satellites, and emergency management. It highlighted the utility and importance of NOAA's space weather products to protecting their infrastructure from damage, but also made clear that they can be further improved to allow for greater accessibility and usability. Improvements in our understanding of space weather will come through robust collaboration between the federal government and partners in both the commercial and academic sectors. Though we, have only witness, though we only have witnesses representing the government and commercial sectors today due to unforeseen circumstances, I would like to stress the important role that the research community plays in shaping these conversations. This is especially true when it comes to understanding the outstanding science questions in this field. It is critical that we continue to foster these partnerships between the government, academia, and commercial sectors. Indeed, it's something that I often remark when I'm at home. This committee in particular does so well. I'm looking forward to today's discussion about the current state of our space weather activities, from fundamental research to forecasting, and receiving feedback on how Congress can support improvements to our forecasting capabilities. I would now like to recognize Mr. Marshall for an opening statement. Thank you, Chairwoman Fletcher, for holding this important hearing today on the topic of space weather. I also want to thank our three witnesses for being here this afternoon and sharing their expertise on this important topic. Space weather is a term many people have not often heard of. The term refers to the interaction of solar activity with technology and life on Earth, as well as in orbit. This is by no means a new phenomena, as we have records of solar activity going back more than 150 years. However, our need to forecast this phenomenon has become more critical as our utilization of space-based technology has increased. When I consider the importance of space weather research to Kansans, I think about the potential negative impacts solar activity can have on our farmer farmers and ranchers. The agriculture sector is usually among the first of industry who adapt new and innovative technologies to improve their operations. Kansas farmers in particular have been at the forefront of adapting precision agriculture practices. Precision agriculture refers to the use of technologies such as GPS and unmanned aerial vehicles to make decisions related to planting crops and implementing conservation practices. The use of these technologies helps our farmers make better informed decisions about the timing and location of planting crops in order to minimize irrigation and use the fertilizer and pesticides. 
I've seen firsthand the improvements in productivity and crop yields for our farmers and ranchers who utilize these techniques. None of these would be possible without the use of GPS and satellite imagery, which are vulnerable <laughs> to solar weather incidents. Accurate weather forecasting is another concern for our farmers. Knowing precisely when to plant crops can help significantly reduce input costs for farmers, which in turn reduces costs for consumers. An especially severe space weather event has the potential to damage our orbiting weather satellites, which in turn would significantly reduce the accuracy of our weather forecast needed to help our farmers make informed decisions. A final area of concern for rural Kansas is the potential impacts a geomagnetic storm could have on our electrical grid. We have a basic understanding of the potential disruptions a severe event could make on our power grid, resulting in blackouts which would affect hospitals, schools, businesses, and our farmers. What we still need is a more advanced knowledge of how to prevent or mitigate the damages a space weather caused blackout could have on critical infrastructure. I look forward to hearing from witnesses on how we can ensure rural Kansas and all Americans are prepared for these events. Thank you, Chairwoman Fletcher, and I yield back. Thank you. I'll now recognize the chair of the Subcommittee on Space and Aeronautics, Ms. Horn, for an opening statement. Thank you, Chairwoman Fletcher. Good afternoon and welcome to our witnesses. I look forward to your testimony today and I am uh, so pleased to be working with uh, Chairwoman Fletcher and, and the ranking members on these two uh, subcommittees on this important hearing uh, about space weather and advancing research, monitoring, and forecasting capabilities. This uh, is a timely, an incredibly timely hearing because it allows us to talk about the connection between what we do in space and our lives every day here on Earth. Our activities in space not only uh, advance and enable scientific discovery and exploration, but also on the Earth, banking, telemedicine, natural resource management, and so much more. The orbiting spacecraft above, weather, communications, GPS, and Earth observing systems are a critical part of our national infrastructure. Solar phenomena or space weather such as solar flares, solar wind, geomagnetic storms of energized, particle, char energized charged particles, however, can disrupt ground and space-based technologies and infrastructure. Space weather can affect everything from electrical power systems, satellites, aircraft, space operations, including human spaceflight operations, and other ground and space-based systems. The list is long. In short, severe space weather events pose a significant threat to our infrastructure and in turn to our economy, our national security, and our lives here on Earth. Currently, NASA's uh, heliospheric research satellites and a NOAA NASA Air Force operational satellite collect observations used in space weather modeling and predictions. NASA's Advanced Composition Explorer and the Joint European Space a Agency, NASA SOHO, mission launched over 20 years ago. Along with other NASA spacecraft, such as STEREO and the Solar Dynamics Observatory, they provide critical information in forecasting solar eruptions and their movement through the heliosphere. However, these systems are aging, and we will have gaps in space weather data once they reach the end of their operating lifespans. We must develop the next generation systems for space weather observations. As a first step, however, we need to understand at a national level what space weather observations and systems are needed. Simply put, we need a strategy. Because we are only at the early stages of our ability to, to predict and forecast space weather, improving our current capabilities will require a strategy and investments in basic research, observations, models, and the ability to transition research and models into operational use. The National Academy's 2013 Solar and Space Physics Decadal Survey stated, Achievement of critical continuity of key space environmental parameters, their utilization in advanced models and application to operations constitute a major endeavor that will, will require unprecedented cooperation among agencies in the areas in which each has specific expertise and unique capabilities. Making advances in space weather will require a coordinated effort among researchers, operational institutions, government, academic, commercial, and international entities. The role and perspectives of academia are, are essential in this effort. 
And while we were unable to include the academic perspective today due to unforeseen circumstances, as uh, Chairwoman Fletcher noted, it's important to recognize the importance of academia in advancing space weather capabilities. Uh, Madam Chair, the nation's efforts to address the threats in space weather demonstrate ways in which our investments in NASA and basic research benefit our society. In the case of space weather, these investments are integral in ensuring the safety and operations of our critical infrastructure on the ground and in space. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses on what is needed to advance our nation's understanding and ability to monitor, predict, and forecast space weather. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. I'd now like to recognize the ranking member for the sub Subcommittee on Space and Aeronautics, Mr. Babin, for an opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chair. I really appreciate it, and thank you, uh, you witnesses, for being here. Uh, thanks for holding this, uh, this hearing. Absolutely. Thank you, Chairwoman. Uh, today's hearing is on a growing topic of national concern. Even if it's not an issue most of our constituents uh, might immediately identify with, Space weather, commonly defined, refers to variations in the space environment between the Earth and the Sun due to solar activity. Uh, this is an ongoing phenomenon which typically has minimal consequences. However, it can have widespread effects such as interfering with GPS signals and disruptions of our electrical grid during severe events. We've had uh, to be more mindful of the effects of space weather as we've increased our use of satellites uh, for communication and remote sensing in our daily lives. Space weather is an issue of importance across the federal government. Agencies such as NASA and NOAA within our committee's jurisdiction play an important role in increasing our knowledge and better monitoring space weather. However, it's important to acknowledge space weather as a national security issue. Our military has a variety of assets in orbit around Earth which could be potentially harmed by electromagnetic interference and are dependent upon satellites built by NASA and operated by NOAA for timely and accurate information. Both the Obama and Trump administrations have acknowledged the need for better coordination of space weather-related activities across the federal government by developing and updating a space weather strategy and an action plan. This plan covers topics about how federal agencies should identify and protect infrastructure from acute space weather events, which agencies should lead mitigation and research activities. Our nation's infrastructure is not all that is threatened by space weather events. I proudly represent the Johnson Space Center, uh, to the home to NASA's astronaut corps. These are the astronauts who currently work on the International Space Station more than 200 miles above the Earth's surface and will one day serve on missions to the moon and Mars. While we have developed techniques and technology to reduce the threats posed by increased radiation exposure due to a severe solar event, we have much more work to do to mitigate these hazards to our astronauts. As the ranking member of the Space and Aeronautics Subcommittee, I've supported efforts to spur the commercialization of low Earth orbit by private sector companies. These new entrants into the space economy have a vested interest in protecting their assets. However, they also offer an opportunity to provide data and resources to our federal agencies as we seek to improve our space weather efforts. As this committee potentially considers legislation relating to space weather monitoring and research, we must be certain that whatever legislation that we mark up is not a top-down legislative mandate and ensures a role for the commercial sector. The Weather Research and Forecasting Innovation Act, which was passed by this committee and signed into law two years ago, serves as a template for how we could accomplish this. The Weather Act took steps to integrate commercial weather data into NOAA's forecast models, and a similar model should guide us when developing space weather legislation. I want to thank our witnesses for taking the time to attend today's hearing and sharing your valuable experiences and expertise on this very important topic. And I look forward to a productive conversation on how we best move forward. And with that, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Babin. If there are members who wish to submit additional opening statements, your statements will be added to the record at this point. This time, I would like to introduce our witnesses. 
Mr. Bill Murtaugh is the program coordinator for the NOAA Space Weather Prediction Center in Boulder, Colorado. In this position, he coordinates preparation and response with emergency managers, industry, and government entities in the U.S. and around the world. Previously, he worked at the, OSHA, at the Office of Science and Technology Policy as the Assistant Director for the Space, Weather, Energy, and Environment Division, where he oversaw the development and implementation of the National Space Weather Strategy and Action Plan. Before this, he spent 23 years in the Air Force working as a weather forecaster. Next, we have Dr. Nicola Fox, the Heliophysics Division Director in the Science Mission Directorate at NASA. Before that, Dr. Fox was Chief Scientist for Heliophysics at the Applied Physics Lab at the Johns Hopkins University, where she was the Project Scientist for NASA's Parker Solar Probe, the first mission ever sent to a star. She previously was Deputy Project Scientist for the Van Allen Probes and the Operations Scientist for the International Solar Terrestrial Physics Program. She received her PhD in Space and Atmospheric Physics from Imperial College, London. Finally, we have retired Navy Vice Admiral Conrad C. Lautenbacher, Jr. Admiral Lautenbacher is the CEO and Director of GeoOptics, a private company that collects and sells actionable Earth systems data to improve prediction and forecasting of weather and climate. He served as the eighth administrator of NOAA during the George W. Bush administration, where he spearheaded the first, ev first ever Earth Observation Summit. Before NOAA, Admiral Lautenbacher founded a management consulting business, worked in nonprofits, and spent 40 years in operational command and staff positions in the Navy. He received his PhD from Harvard University in applied mathematics. For our witnesses, thank you for your written testimony, which will be included in the record of the hearing. You will each have five minutes for your oral testimony because your written testimony is already included. And when you've spoken, when you've completed your spoken testimony, we will begin with questions from the members. Each member will have five minutes to ask questions of the panel. We will start uh, with opening statements, and uh, we'll start. We'll start first with you, Mr. Murtag. Good afternoon, Chairs Fletcher and Horn, Ranking Members Babbitt and Marshall, and members of the committee. I am Bill Murta, the Program Coordinator for NOAA's Space Weather Prediction Center, or SWPSI, in Boulder, Colorado. NOAA is the official source of U.S. government for civilian space weather forecast warnings and alerts to the public, industry, and government agencies. We work closely with the U.S. Air Force, who is responsible for all DOD and related national security needs for space weather information. We work with NASA and other federal agencies, as well as private industry, academia, and international partners to ensure access to data and analysis that support our 24-7 mission to deliver products and service to protect our society and our economy from space weather events. These events could drastically affect our electric power grid, telecommunications, our GPS-dependent technologies, astronauts and space exploration, and of course, aviation. Critical to our mission operations are observations, forecasts and warnings, science, and partnerships. I'll briefly highlight each, each one of these. NOAA uses an array of space and ground-based observations employing specialized instruments to support our space weather forecast operations and related research. NOAA operates at three viewpoints to acquire the space-based observations necessary to meet SWPSI's operational requirements. In deep space, at the Lagrange point, which is located one million miles from Earth, we observe the solar wind. A geostationary orbit for key observations of solar flares, X-rays, and energetic particle radiation, and a lower Earth orbit for measurements of the ionosphere. NOAA also leverages additional data from NASA and European satellites. And we're in the process of developing the Space Weather Follow-On Program, which will provide mission continuity and augment capabilities at the L1 point and in geostationary orbit. Ground-based data are also important to SWPSI operations, in particular, magnetic field observations provided by the USGS, which are critical to our geomagnetic storm warning processes. Radio and solar observations provided by the US Air Force and solar magnetic field maps from the NSF. Once a solar eruption occurs, forecasters feed these observations into computer models to determine the likely effects of solar events on Earth. 
These models help forecasters estimate when the effects will begin, how long they will last, and how severe the event will be. Similar to the categories we use to classify hurricanes or tornadoes, there are space weather scales for communicating the severity of space weather storms. These scales address radio blackouts from solar flares, solar radiation storms due to the sun-emitted energetic particles, and geomagnetic storms from coronal mass ejected plasma and magnetic fields, we call coronal mass ejections. The scales list possible impacts for each level of storming and indicate how often these events might happen. NOAA's space weather alerts and warnings are employed by federal agencies and users across many sectors to aid in national preparedness and response to space weather. NOAA is also advancing our research to operations processes. This includes a new program, the Earth Prediction Innovation Center, or EPIC. EPIC will use partnerships with academia, the private sector, and relevant agencies to test and validate new capabilities and transition these capabilities from research to operations, thereby improving our existing forecast and warning capabilities. NOAA is also exploring with NASA the potential for a space weather testbed to further accelerate the transfer of research to operations and operations to research. Strong public-private partnerships are essential to maintain and approve the observing networks, conduct the research, create forecast models, and supply the services necessary to support our national security and our economic prosperity. NOAA is committed to working towards the growth of the private sector as our national infrastructure and technological base becomes more sensitive to the impacts of space weather thus demanding more improved space weather services. NOAA will continue to explore partnerships with the commercial and academic community as we work to maintain and improve our operational capabilities. In closing, NOAA appreciates the ongoing support we have received from Congress for our critically important space weather program. We will continue to work with other federal agencies in the private sector in this effort to develop and strengthen our activities in space weather research and forecasting and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much. Dr. Fox? Chairwoman Horn and Fletcher, Ranking Members Babin and Marshall, and members of the subcommittees, it is an honor to appear before these subcommittees today to discuss NASA's contributions to the understanding of space weather and its impacts on society. Space weather is the res result of complex interactions between the sun, solar wind, Earth's magnetic field, and Earth's atmosphere. Our ability to understand and predict space weather is of growing importance to our nation's economy, national security, and of course, our NASA astronauts. Through its Artemis program, NASA is accelerating its exploration plans to land the first woman and the next man on the surface of the moon by 2024. To meet these objectives, we continue to accelerate development of the systems required to ensure success. The Artemis missions will send humans beyond the protection of Earth's magnetic field for the first time since Apollo and expose our astronauts and the systems upon which they will depend to a unique and pot potentially hazardous space weather environment. NASA's Heliophysics Division is working with the Artemis program to support the human exploration of deep space and on approaches to measure the radiation environment on and around the moon. These measurements will aid in the prediction and validation of the radiation environment in which our astronauts will be subjected. Looking further into the future to journeys to Mars, NASA astronauts will need the capability to autonomously generate their own space weather data and predictions. To this end, the Heliophysics Division is working with the Space Radiation Analysis Group, or SHRAG, at the Johnson Space Center on possible experiments in cislunar space to develop the science and technology needed for such predictions. Artemis holds an important potential as a platform for scientific research. There is intense interest in what we can discover at the moon. The lunar samples returned during the Apollo program dramatically changed our view of the solar system, and scientists continue to unlock new secrets from the samples. Artemis missions may include installation of space weather instruments on the moon, and studies of the lunar surface could yield significant insights into the space weather over long time scales. There's just so much more to learn. Knowledge that we can acquire with sustained human and robotic presence on the moon. 
NASA already addresses space weather impacts on astronauts and spacecraft while maintaining the International Space Station and protecting the astronauts living there. The Community Coordinated Modeling Center, or CCMC, team at, the, at Goddard Space Flight Center works with NOAA's Space Weather Prediction Center to provide data and forecast to the SHRAG, who can then assess risks to the ISS. This experience will help NASA as we continue how to best protect Artemis astronauts from space weather impacts. Space weather events are not only a concern for our astronauts and spacecraft, airline travel, communications, and precision navigation and timing systems like uh, global GPS systems and the electrical power grid on which we depend every day can be impacted by space weather. The NASA Heliophysics Division continues to study the sun and how it influences the very nature of space, the atmospheres of planets, and in the case of Earth, the technology that exists in low Earth orbit and on the surface. The extensive dynamic solar atmosphere surrounds the sun, Earth, and planets, and extends far out into the solar system. Mapping out this interconnected system requires a holistic study of the sun's influence. NASA has a fleet of spacecraft strategically placed throughout our heliosphere, from Parker Solar Probe nearest the sun, observing the very start of the solar wind, to satellites around Earth, including the Ionospheric Connection Explorer, or ICON mission, which launched earlier this month to the very farthest human-made objects, the Voyagers, which are still sending back observations on interstellar space. Each mission is positioned at a critical, well-thought-out vantage point to observe and understand the flow of energy and particles throughout the solar system, and each provide a very different view of the complex system that leads to the space weather that we experience. The research carried out by NASA's Heliophysics Division is improving our understanding of space weather. Working as the research arm of the nation's space weather effort, NASA uh, coordinates with NOAA, the National Science Foundation, and the US Geological Survey, and of course, the Department of Defense. NASA is also a member of the Space Weather Operations Research and Mitigations Interagency Working Group run by the National Science and Technology Council, which coordinates interagency efforts to carry out the actions and meet the objectives identified in the Space Weather st uh, Strategy and Action Plan. In support of the nation's space weather effort, the Heliophysics Division has established the Space Weather Science and Applications, or SWIXA, program in collaboration with our sister federal agencies, academia and industry. The goal of this program is to effectively support the transition of heliophysics science results to applications that support our user communities and to provide improvements in space weather prediction models, such as those used by SWIPSI. This activity also supports the interagency space weather efforts and is consistent with the recommendations of the 2013 Decadal Survey. Furthermore, in coordination with NOAA, we have initiated a pilot program to expand the interagency capability and improve space weather products and services. We meet regularly with NOAA to develop this shared framework for research to operations, and as this matures, we will further integrate NSF, DOD, academia, and the private industry. NASA really appreciates the continued support from these committees, which ensures that the United States maintains a superior position in understanding space weather and is prepared to respond to space weather events. We look forward to continued collaboration with our sister agencies, international partners, academia, and industry, and I thank you very much for your invitation to be here with you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Fox. Admiral Lautenbacher. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Fletcher and Chairman Horn, ranking members Marshall and Babin, and distinguished members of the subcommittees. It is my honor to appear before you today at this important hearing to discuss advancing research, monitoring, and the forecasting capabilities for space weather. Geooptics has been fulfilling its NOAA NESDIS contract under the Commercial Weather Data Pilot, CWDP, program, and has successfully delivered over 350,000 high data accuracy GPS radio occultation profiles by the end of September 2019. Having successfully demonstrated our data, we look forward to NOAA NESDA soon announcing its commercial data buy program. Our success in demonstrating uh, our technical capability to NOAA NESDA would not have been possible without the leadership and support of many on this community, on this committee, and especially Congressman Frank Lucas, Congresswoman Su Suzanne Bonamici, and former Congressman Jim Bridenstine for their support of the Commercial Weather Data Program in the Weather Research and Forecast Innovation Act of 2017. Our founder, Tom Young, originally proposed the GPS RO technique in 1988 
and oversaw the development and improvement of the world's leading capability at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, known as JPL. Over the last decade, a series of government-funded satellites have refined the RO technology and proven out its tremendous capability. Geooptics CICERO, which stands for Community Initiative for Cellular Earth Remote Observation Nanosatellites, is the only U.S.-based RO provider with the JPL gold standard for some of the most accurate weather and climate data available, offering significantly more impact per measurement than traditional weather instruments. We have worked with our partners at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and TIVAC Nano Satellite Systems to commercialize and miniaturize this technology. By launching smaller, less expensive satellites, we will be able to make orders of magnitude more data available to weather forecasters and scientists around the world. And our pledge to the scientific community is that all Cicero data will be provided free for any research purpose. Radio occultation data provides high resolution temperature and water vapor profiles by gaining measurements of bending angle profiles in the troposphere and the stratosphere with high vertical resolution and accuracy. The measurement of bending animals, angles can be used to obtain information on refractory refractivity profiles, which can be used to retrieve atmospheric temperature and humidity profiles, as well as surface pressure. pressure. Another object objective is to provide space weather information through measurement of electron density and its profile in the middle and high atmosphere. There is a robust interest from other private sector space weather technology companies to work with federal agencies to develop and implement solutions to deal with space weather. For example, GeoOptics is a member of the American Commercial Space Weather Association, uh, commonly known as AXWA, which is comprised of 19 member companies with the common goal of delivering, uh, developing, delivering, and sustaining key space weather products and services to mitigate threats to social uh, societal infrastructure. AXWA plays an essential role in the academic, governmental, commercial triad that forms the space weather enterprise. AXWA companies provide the insight, innovation, and cost benefit to our nation's preparedness and responsiveness to space weather threats. AXWA is a collective voice for the commercial space weather sector and an advocate for the enterprise. Since its inception in 2010, beginning with five companies, AXWA has quadrupled in size. AXWA serves as a catalyst for collaboration between various organizations and the commercial space weather industry. AXWA works with government agencies, academia, and industry stakeholders to strengthen the space weather enterprise and to pr promote space weather, space weather partnerships and public commercial initiatives. Last year, NOAA NESDIS issued its final report of the NOAA Space Platform Requirements Working Group, the SPRIG, in support of the NOAA Satellite Observing System Architecture study. As a part of this study, NESDIS initiated the Space Platform Requirements Working Group, commonly known as the SPRIG, to evaluate the future needs and relative priorities for weather, space weather, and environmental remote sensing, including land mapping, space-based observations for the 2030 timeframe and beyond. NOAA one has only to look at the ranking of the space weather measurements that were identified by leading uh, NOAA and university research scientists in the SPRIG report and compare them to the technological capabilities offered by AXWA uh, members. Increased investment are, are needed from Congress to continue to fund the commercial data buy program for GPS RO data that benefit now casting and commercial weather, and co commercial weather prediction. Congress should also consider a commercial space weather data program for commercial sectors to provide, uh, provide cost-effective solutions for the challenges of space weather as defined in the NEG, uh, in the NOAA SPRIG report. The American Commercial Space Weather Association and its member com companies look forward to working with Congress and federal agencies in advancing their knowledge and understanding of space weather. Thank you for your consideration. I will do my best to address any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much. At this point, we will begin our questions. Um, we'll begin our first round, and I'm going to start recognizing myself for five minutes. Um, first question really goes to solar wind data and um, DISCOVER. So NOAA's Deep Space Climate Observatory, or DISCOVER, satellite is a partnership between NOAA, NASA, and the U.S. Air Force to provide real-time solar wind data and to succeed 
NASA's Advanced Composition Explorer, or ACE, satellite, um, which is beyond its expected lifetime. It was launched in 2015 with an expected lifetime of five years, but has been in a safe safe hold mode since June of this year and is no longer transmitting data, leading NOAA to revert back to collecting solar and wind data from ACE. Mr. Murtaugh, how critical are real-time solar wind observations to the, to the development of space weather forecasts? They are indeed critical. Uh, we consider those measurements at L1, the, it's our sentinel in space. When the coronal mass ejection leaves the sun, we can see it from some, some other instruments we use to, to, to observe it, that it's actually Earth-directed. But we really don't, we, we can't dissect it. We don't know what's in that CME till it hits the L1 point. And key to the measurements at L1 is the orientation of the magnetic field. Because what the sun just shot out into space was a magnet, a coronal mass ejection, a big magnetic field, and Earth is a magnetic field. The two magnetic fields are going to come together, and how they couple together is going to dictate how intense the geomagnetic response, the storm response will be. So we need, that's our last, once, we, once it passes that spacecraft, we have a sense for exactly what the field is going to look like, and we immediately notify, especially the electric power grid operators around this country, just how big the storm is likely to be. So we depend on that absolutely. And this is a question for you and for Dr. Fox. What other avenues of receiving solar wind data are available if NOAA is unable to get Discover back online and the ACE satellite stops transmitting data? None, really. We have, um, we, we are, um, we are essentially blind if we lose the, the ACE data and the Discover data. Dr. Fox, do you want to weigh in on that? Uh, so we would be blind until 2024. Uh, in 2024, NASA will launch uh, the IMAP mission, which is a mission really dedicated on looking at the outside um, of our, our heliosphere and the boundary to interstellar space. Uh, but we will carry with us the um, NOAA uh, Space Weather Follow-On uh, L1 Observatory as a rideshare. And uh, so once once we're out there on orbit, then, then that gap would be filled. But um, Bill is completely correct. Between those two events, there would be not. There really is no way of getting anything out there either. Okay. And are there um, any other long-term contingency plans uh, for getting solar wind data beyond um, what you've described, either this program in 2024 or the existing data collection mechanisms? Yes, it's fortunately very much recognized by NOAA the importance of this data. So we're pursuing as Dr. Fox just mentioned, the 2024 launch. Uh, but we've also just released a broad area announcement where to the, to, the, to, to the world, if you will, where we want to look at what we should have uh, as a follow-on. So we've already, that's, that we've already begun the process of looking at what, what we need to have up there after uh, the IMAP mission. Okay. Thank you. Um, switching gears a little bit, I do want to talk um, with the remaining time I have left about our investments in space weather um, and want to ask in your estimation, um, what is the current federal investment in research compared to operations for space weather and what should the ratio of investment be in order to substantively improve our forecasting capabilities? So I, I would say there's... Um, our budget at SWPSI is uh, about 11 million or thereabouts, but one has to recognize that a considerable amount of funds go to the observation platforms within NOAA, both at the uh, Discover, the L1 commitment, and of course our spacecraft at geosynchronous orbit, uh, also very, very, very much critical in the, for the provision of space weather services uh, for the nation. Uh, I think um, an awful lot of money goes towards the research, but so it should. When you, you've, you may have heard in the past about us being about 30 to 50 years behind the meteorology community, it's largely because the fundamental research necessary to better understand the processes on the sun and the eruptions on the sun and how they interact with the earth, there is so much research still necessary to get us where we need to be. Dr. Fox, do you want to weigh in on that before uh, we wrap up? Also, the, the sheer space that we have to cover is very different. Uh, the, the sun is, is 93 million miles away, and there is a, sh you know, so it, it is easy to say we are behind the, the, the terrestrial weather, but there is an awful lot more space to cover, and which makes it very important for us to have continued measurements covering that full area. 
Thank you so much. And I have gone over my time, um, but I thank you for your answers to my questions. And I will now recognize Mr. Marshall for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman. My first uh, question for Mr. Murtaugh. I mentioned in my opening statement the importance of precision agriculture, uh, precision agriculture for Kansas farmers and ranchers, and the dependence upon data from satellites in Orba. Has NOAA reached out to any agriculture groups, any opportunities there that you would like to educate us on? Uh, yes, perhaps I could answer that with a little story. Uh, five or six years ago, we got contacted by a company that uh, develops the machinery for farming. And we had had a space weather event a few weeks earlier, and they got all sorts of calls from, from their customers trying to figure out why their GPS-dependent technology was not working so well. And they actually, the, the, the company realized it was a space weather event. Uh, they reached out to us. They said, could we get the information to them? And they, in turn, would redistribute it to all their customers. And we saw that as a great way of doing it. So we, we, we followed up with them and others as much as we can, the, 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 the folks that make the machinery, that um, make the equipment that goes into that machinery, the GPS-dependent uh, equipment, and let them distribute the information to all the users. And we know it's worked because we have this product subscription service with over 50,000 uh, subscribers right now. And when I look at that, as I do every month with the several hundred new subscribers, I will see lots of different farming groups signing up for the alerts and warning. So we've got the word out there. I think we can do more. So do you, are you able to predict those uh, an hour before, a day before, a week before? So what, the, the, um, what they're most concerned about is impacts on the ionosphere, typically associated with geomagnetic storms. So when we see the eruption on the sun, we can typically give them one to three day notice that something's going to be coming and something's going to be disturbing the ionosphere. Stay tuned because they can yeah. plan their farming for tomorrow and get a warning from us and say we'll postpone that activity till the next day. And, and typically they're knocked out for a day or two or as Sometimes opposed just to... hours, but uh, on okay. the big storms, and sometimes we have an outbreak, October 2003 comes to mind, where this storming went on and off for about two weeks. So we like to get that information continuously flowing into the agricultural groups knowing, be careful if you use your GPS and you're expecting precision navigation or precision measurements because uh, it may not be there. Okay, Admiral Lautenbacher, what are the ideal roles, roles for the federal government the academic community and the commercial sector in developing strategies to address severe space weather events? I think it's very important that we have a, an architecture that sets up the, uh, uh, the joining and melding of these great uh, assets that we have in the United States. Uh, I, when you look at the government, the government has to set the rules, make the rule set so that the playing field is fair. And so that needs to be said. And government has the only people that can do that. Nobody else can do that. The rest of it is competition. Academia is, re is need needed for government investment in the research you just heard. That has to go on, and that's mostly uh, done in our academic world. So we're, are, we're dependent upon that. And when you get to the commercial sector, you have the uh, ingenuity and the uh, experience of working to provide very efficient solutions to the research that's been invented and the needs of the of the space prediction centers and if we put that together in that way and have a, a comprehensive uh, uh, combination of those forces we can do much better than we do today okay yeah I yield back thank you Thank you very much. I'd now like to recognize Ms. Horn for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is uh, incredi incredibly important. I'm glad we're having this conversation. Uh, as I mentioned in, in my opening statement, I want to turn to a couple uh, a more discussion. This is a question for all of you, a couple of questions about the gaps so we can better understand as we address these issues. Uh, the bottom line, I think, is we have to do what's necessary to protect our space assets. We, we've covered many reasons from farming to our communications, our electrical grid, and our national security. So in looking at these risks to our infrastructure, I'd like to hear from each of you briefly, what are the biggest gaps in our for, uh, space weather forecasting capabilities and what uh, what we should prioritize to make the biggest impact in reducing these gaps? I'll, um, there, there are so many. 
unfortunately, I refer to them as the holy grails when I talk to our colleagues in the science community. One is simply this. Uh, again, I'll give you an example. It was October 17, 2003. I'm on the forecast desk. I'm looking at the sun. There's no sunspots. We need sunspots typically if we're going to have big activity. I've got customers asking what space weather going to look like for the next week. I say, well, pretty darn calm looking right now. One week later, we had three Jupiter-sized sunspot clusters. That's about 10 times the diameter of Earth on the sun. These were intense, Carrington-like, very large, complex sunspot groups. The bottom line is this. We have no real ability to predict that's going to happen. If we could only understand a little bit about when these sunspots are going to emerge, and when they do start growing, when are they going to stop growing? Because that happens sometimes too. We'll have them grow in one day, two days later, and then it's gone. But it is a big, big limitation. People ask us what's going to happen a week or two from now. Well, we really don't know. In solar minimum, not much sunspot activity, solar max, but we cannot forecast those sunspots. And one last piece, when the sunspots do emerge, and we know there's potential for big eruptions. Five minutes prior to the eruption, we don't know what's about to occur. So there are significant limitations, and I limited my comments to the sun. I could share all the way down to Earth with some of the serious challenges we face. So I would say, you know, NASA is really addressing a lot of these gaps by, by putting up the new missions. Parker Solar Probe, of course, springs to mind um, as, as now being the first mission to a star that is really going in and helping us to unlock exactly this area that, that Mr. Murtaugh was just talking about, which is how do these sunspots, what is the structure of them? And the only way to really do that is to go and study them up close. And so we are certainly making big strides to close those gaps. I do think that um, we need to do a continued effort to transition our scientific models in to operational platforms, which we're working incredibly closely with, with our colleagues at NOAA to do that. And uh, you even, we you know, we talked about the framework and the, the test beds to really take advantage of all of the stuff that we are doing in the NASA Heliophysics Division and really taking, taking benefit of all of that amazing science research and getting it into the um, operational community. The gaps uh, that we, we have today could, uh, could leave us in, in very big trouble in the United States. Uh, a Carrington event today, as opposed to when it actually occurred, would be disastrous, worth maybe $20 billion just to think about trying to recover the power systems that we have, all of the wonderful uh, television and radio and, and, and uh, computer connections and our entire uh, energy system. Uh, would be devastated. And to, to even imagine to try to recover that is, is, is huge. So th these gaps are not, not meant, you know, then the number of gaps cause that, uh, that issue. We, we really need to work on the plans that we built, and, I, and I've got right here a copy of this, the SPRIG uh, study, which has, has il illustrated what we need to do in here in terms of the types of of measures we need to take, the type of instruments we need to have, and we need to get the money and the support to do this. Thank you. Thank you all. I just have a, a few seconds left, so I'll keep this short, but I think it's an important uh, piece to touch on. Uh, and that is determining the difference uh, from space between space weather and artificial or manufactured events, especially in the uh, in the area of our national security, uh, how 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 much are we able to distinguish between those? And I'll, I'll because of time, uh, Mr. Murtal, I just I'll direct that to you. Where where are we in that capability, and what do we need to do to address that well, big question? Well, well certainly the um, and it's one of the reasons we really want to make sure we we get our information and data out. We work globally. It is a, it's a, space weather has a global effect. So when one of these big space weather events happen, we want everybody to know it is in fact the natural environment that's causing the problems. So we, uh, it's just a key element in the process here is, is, is to make sure people are, the situational awareness. Uh, obviously the DOD have their own capabilities to, uh, to sense when it's not uh, natural, uh, so. Thank you, I yield back. Thank you. I'll now recognize Mr. Babin for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, 
y'all have already touched on some of this, but I'm, with, with advanced warning, uh, Mr. Murto, with advanced warning, what can we do on Earth to, to prevent a major ca catastrophe such as an electric power outage? You can't really tell in advance. What can we do to harden our systems and, uh, down here? And uh, We've been talking about this for years, and mm -hmm. I'm not sure we've re yet taken it, taken it seriously mm -hmm. uh, from a national security standpoint. Can you address that? Yeah, I, I think the um, I think the Federal Energy Regulatory, Regulatory Commission stepped in some years ago to um, es essentially to advise the the uh, industry that this was a real threat and then direct standards. So the uh, the power industry uh, there's essentially two pieces to it here. One <coughs> is the engineering solution. So they are exploring opportunities to harden the various components of the grid. So there's a lot of work on the way right now um, trying to, to do just that. The second piece is the operational response. And that is essentially that we get the alerts and warnings out to them and they understand what to do with the information. So again, that's really an awful lot of work just in the past several months and, and years to, uh, to, to address that threat. So we're coming at a kind of a two-pronged approach, the engineering solution uh, and the operations response. But I think because government and FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, did step in and mandate these activities, things are happening. That's good. Glad, very glad to hear that. Uh, and Dr. Fox, are astronomy and heliophysics the same thing? And if not, what are the differences, and which discipline should lead to uh, space weather activities as it pertains to research and operations? So the sun is the star, as we all, we all like to say, and so there's a lot of overlap um, between astronomy and heliophysics, but heliophysics is really focused on the study of our star, our sun, and its impact on, on Earth, um, both, uh, you know, a, a high up, and very close down to us, all the technology that we, we really rely on is sort of lives in the heliophysics neighborhood. Um, uh, they, we, but it's extremely important as we, we move to look for exoplanets and habitability in other, um, around other stars, that you know, heliophysics and astro are very linked there because what you can learn about our star in our back, kind of in our backyard is, is then applicable to other, other astrophysics um, systems. But heliophysics is, really has the, the science, uh, it's the science research arm of the National Space Weather Program. Thank you very much, fascinating. Uh, and Admiral uh, Lautenbacher, uh, how important is space weather? Just a general question, but how important is space weather to our national security? It's a lot more important than most people think, I gotta right. tell you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's incredibly important. Uh, in, in, uh, uh, the, uh, the problems we would have with uh, an attack, uh, a, a natural attack, if you wanna call it that, uh, with with the uh, with our power grids and our electronics that run the world today would would just stall things yeah. uh, it, it, where they are. We need to have a lot more people in all sectors understand what that means because it's a it, we're talking about a whole society. We're not talking necessarily about one store or one power plant. And we're we were talking about months to try to get power plants back online and, and all of the things that we use to control our manufacturing, our food production, all, all, all of the uh, relationships we have between uh, companies and the governments and uh, the, the basic items that are needed for life are, are absolutely uh, in, the, in the mix on this. So we need to take this very seriously. We need to get more people involved the private sector has a lot to offer, and so do all the uh, uh, agencies. And they need to be put together in these plans, which have been got, uh, which have been put together uh, with with experts. And we need to fund them and support them. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Thank you very much. One more question: How, and this is for you, Admiral. How is the space weather information collected by NOAA shared with the general public and the private sector, and how can NOAA better serve non-federal organizations that may be interested in space weather forecasting information? Admiral? Yes. Uh, 
I thought that was for someone else. Okay, I know. You want me to repeat it? <laughs> Please. Sure. Because <laughs> I didn't hear the first how, part. How is, the sp how is the space weather information collected by NOAA? And how is it shared with the general public and the private sector? And how can NOAA better serve non-federal organizations that may be interested in space weather forecasting information? Uh, I got it. Okay. And, and why I checked out was you said NOAA. I was last ahead of NOAA in 2008. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I thought, I thought that would go to Bill. But anyway, that's okay. Because <laughs> he's... Well, he, he, if whichever, I don't, I'm out of time, so whoever wants to answer that can. Yeah, Bill, do you want to, do you want to try it? Because you're here. Yeah. You're, I am not current on exactly what NOAA is doing in all of the things. I can tell you what I'd like to have them do, and sort of, but I'm not current on that. Bill may be more current than I am right now. I'm, I'm out of time, so just very rapidly, okay. if you don't mind. Yeah, well, well we, we, uh, we have a policy in order to make sure this data is made publicly freely available uh, to all. So uh, we have different systems uh, to, to, to bring the, ground-based systems to bring down the space weather information, and we redistribute it, we process it and redistribute it and make it available, pretty much everything we do to everybody out there. Right. Okay. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. I'll now recognize Ms. Bonamici for five minutes. Thank you so much. Thank you to our witnesses for your testimony and your, your expertise. I, I noticed when Dr. Babin made his opening statement, he made a comment about how space weather might not be at the top of the minds of our constituents. It didn't come up in any of my town hall meetings, but I think if you said to people, what if there was something that would disrupt your power, affect flights, your GPS wouldn't work, I think they would all be very, very concerned. <clears throat> and we know um, that space weather has the potential to affect our planet, our economy, everything so instantly. And as we continue to rely on infrastructure like electric power grids and aviation satellites and global navigation satellite systems, <clears throat> and as we promote greater exploration of space, I think we become more susceptible to the effects. So last year when we had the hearing um, on space weather, we, it was revealed that the United States is probably decades behind uh, the forecast capabilities for terrestrial uh, weather predictions. <clears throat> and we don't have the capabilities to prepare ourselves before an event occurs. And when you look at the cost of preventing an impact, it's probably quite low compared to recovering from an event. So Mr. Murtag, in your testimony, you talked about the space weather scales mm -hmm. and the communicating the relative or determining the relative severity of space weather storms. And last Congress, um, I worked with Ranking Member Lucas on the Weather Research and Forecasting Innovation Act. Thank you, Admiral uh, Lautenbacher, for your, your mention. Uh, we had extensive conversations in this committee about how weather forecasts don't serve the needs of the public unless they're effectively communicated. So following up, actually, on the conversation you were having with Dr. Babin, the stakes seem even higher for space uh, weather events. So how does NOAA balance communicating the urgency um, of space weather events, but also recognizing the level of an uncertainty that persists in forecasting these events. So we absolutely prioritize getting the message into the hands of the right people first. If it, it, it's a business where if, if we do all the right things, in other words, we, we detect, we observe the incident, we predict it correctly, we get the information into the hands of the power grid operators, they take action, and nothing happens because we everything works right. So we've got to get the information into the hands of the satellite operators, grid operators, wanna, that is our number one priority. We do also recognize the fact that social media, while it's great in so many ways, <laughs> it could be really <laughs> uh, hell during a, a space weather right. event. Right. Uh, so one of the things we do as quickly as we can is initiate, we, and we've worked this with through the comms office at National Weather Service and NOAA, is to initiate a, a media, uh, not, a, not, not a press, it would be a press call, a media call, telecall. We bring in about 100 plus, I think, in the last uh, time we activated that. And we try to get the messaging out. We try to use the main, mainstream media to get good information mm -hmm. out there because all sorts of things are going to be said sure, and sure. we need to, uh, you know, our website's going to have the information, but uh, who's going right. to be running to SWIFC, right? It, right? I think last time I, I asked about risk management and event risk management and, you know, there are vulnerabilities in those systems, as we know. I, I want to ask Dr. Fox a question. What I really want to ask you is what's on your shirt, um, but I am going to ask you, is that the, is that the most important question of the... 
<laughs> Are they hearing? <laughs> is it something related to space weather? So it's, it's Parker's solar probe. And in my defense, I'm giving an IAC lecture at 6 p.m. on Parker's solar probe. <laughs> perfect. I'm kind of dual dressed perfect. today. It's I perfect. apologize. Thank you. <laughs> um, so Dr. Wax, in your testimony, you highlighted several key missions that will help map out the mm -hmm. interconnected system and provide a holistic um, assessment of the sun's influence. So um, following up on the conversation about gaps in research, um, what do we need to fill them? I, I think um, Representative Horn asked about what the gaps were. Um, how can Congress help fill those gaps? What are the best ways to do that? So, uh, the, I mean, I think everything, one of the really nice things about being the heliophysics director is everything that all the science that we do really does have a public purpose. You know, it, it is really easily translatable. There is a reason that we do it. It's really, really cool science. It's really great research, but there's always this human benefit because we are looking at the impact of our closest star on us here at Earth. So we do continue to launch new missions. Um, we, we are very thoughtful about the new missions that we select through our Explorer program and through our, some of our strategic programs. And we, of course, really, really do look to the National Academy. Um, so as we move into our next decadal, um, to be looking at better helping us to really you know, put the science where it needs to be. And so really keeping the focus on the importance of space weather and the importance of heliophysics as a discipline is really critical. And, and in my last few seconds, is it is there agreement on where the gaps are among everyone here? Do we all agree where... Does everybody agree where the gaps are and then we have to figure out how to fill them? <laughs> so I think probably any scientist will tell you the gap is in their favorite <laughs> area of science. Um, but uh, I mean, really um, going, uh, understanding the star, so uh, really exactly what Mr. Murtag said, you know, going in and understanding those sunspots, that's the key, the, you know, understanding how they, how they form and then better being able to say, oh, that one, I, I've seen that before, that one's going to do this tomorrow. And that you really can only do that by going in and really understanding the star. Thank you. I'm and my we, we do work very closely together. We Perfect. <laughs> my time has expired. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. I'll now recognize Mr. Posey for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairs and, and ranking members for holding this uh, very important meeting. I think uh, space weather is uh, one of the most underprioritized uh, subjects that we have in Congress. Uh, we heard from a panel uh, previously that we missed a solar interruption, or CME that you call it, a couple years ago by one week on our orbit uh, that would have uh, knocked out all our satellites, killed all our power grids. And, and they could only describe it. They couldn't even quantify the damage other than say it would have been catastrophic. Uh, there was a book written about a similar uh, uh, knocking out of our grid called One Second After. I don't know if any of you all have ever read that book before, but it's, it's just as frightening. And that was written from uh, uh, reports that members of Congress have received on the EMP threat, same as effect as we'd have from one of those huge solar eruptions. And so uh, a question that, that I have for you is, you know, uh, what plan uh, does our government have uh, in place uh, if our satellites and spacecraft uh, detected a uh, geomagnetic storm uh, headed right for us? So the, uh, it, it um, would depend, of course, on which sector we're talking about. Uh, yeah. when, when a big event is coming, we are in touch with the satellite operators around the world, power grid operators, um, the, the aviation dispatchers, and they'll reroute the flights away from the poles and whatnot. But the, the key right now, there's, a, there's, a net, there's an effort underway within the Space Weather Operations and Research and Mitigation Working Group at, uh, at uh, OSTP to define benchmarks where we want to say how big is big so we can protect against uh, that level because that's that's kind of where we're at right now, the step is we've got to recognize that number, that value, and then work with industry to take the appropriate steps. It's happening already to some degree, obviously, with the power grid. We have given them a number, they have volts per kilometer. If we get to this value, you need to assess, will you survive? They are doing that right now. They'll understand which equipment is vulnerable and then take action to protect it. So hopefully in the coming not too distant future, we get to a place where we think that they can stand, withstand 
almost Carrington type uh, event. So we're working on getting there because we know a lot about this storm. We didn't 20 years ago. We do now. We're working towards mitigating, hardening the system, if you will, to, to withstand one of these big events. Yeah, I, I've noticed industry <clears throat> hasn't had much interest in hardening. Yeah. Uh, industry is interested in bottom line and bonuses for the next fiscal year. Right. Uh, yeah. What do you think uh, we should do to overcome that? Uh, I, I, well, I think that, and I mentioned this already, FERC stepping in and telling them that they had to do the, uh, directing them to do this assessment what was critical. And it, where it's difficult is not in the high latitude states, states that border Canada recognize this threat because they experience it quite regularly. It's the mid latitude states and the lower latitude. Mm -hmm. Those folks could have been there for 40 years working that system and they'll say, oh, why am I worried about this? I've never seen this before. This is, we haven't had an 1859 event since 1859. Right. So the, the only way really to get them motivated to move and do the right things largely, I feel, was FERC stepping in. Yeah, and they, what are, besides the, uh, the outages uh, that uh, caused Quebec to lose their power for about nine hours, mm -hmm. what other ones are we aware of? Are, so, are there a bunch of other minor ones? Yeah, there was, so actually, yeah, there was, there was, we we'll go back to 1859 for that big event. 1921, there was a paper published just last month suggesting that the 1921 storm might have been as big as Carrington. And that 21 storm was the one that caused a lot of fires in, in railway, they call it the railway storm, because it actually caused fires downtown Manhattan in the railway station due to the induced current. So there was that one, and the one you mentioned in, in uh, July 2012, which was a near miss, uh, that was, so there were three or four Carrington class events. There's been many, many others. The Bastille Day events, uh, Dr. Fox just whispered in my ear, was a big one that occurred in 2000. There was the 2003 event that brought the grid down in Malmo, Sweden, and damaged many transformers in the ESCOM network in South Africa. So I could go on and on with a list uh, of these. Uh, <clears throat> obviously, the research is important to the survival of our species. Yeah. And, you know, what effect do you think we would have globally if the 1859 of event happened today? Well, I, I think it, it uh, would be significant in uh, many ways, obviously. Um, again, depending on which sector. We're, and it's a, a huge part of this whole national strategy and action plan that was referenced already is to the, one of the first big parts of that is assess the vulnerability of our critical infrastructure. We're in the process of doing that now to get to a point where we can accurately answer your question. It's just what would happen if we got this level of storming. We have a, still a lot of work to do to understand that vulnerability. Okay, thank you. So we really don't know. Madam Chair, thank you for letting him answer the question. Thank you, Mr. Posey. Um, I'll now recognize Mr. Tonko for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Fletcher, and thank you, Chairwoman Horn, for both of you for holding this hearing, and thank you for the witnesses for joining us today. Space weather may seem like a far-off topic, but it has many implications, as we all know for our lives on Earth. Our ability to monitor and predict space weather events hinges on our continued support for research, for the workforce, and for innovative collaboration. Um, this past August, the new NOAA USGS model for electric power grid operators went live. This map illustrates regional electric field levels in the U.S. using real, uh, near real-time data to show the extent of space weather impact that could affect the power grid. So, Mr. Murtaugh, since its launch, to what extent has the map been useful to grid operators in mitigating the impacts of space weather on critical infrastructure? Not, not much use yet, just because we haven't had anything happen since its release. However, we think it's a huge step forward, and I'll tell you why. When SWPC issues a warning for on the scales we talked about, G4, it's, it's a geomagnetic storm, emphasis on geo, meaning it's an earth storm. What the folks in this nation that operate the grid want to know is what about where I live, what's going to happen? What's going to happen to the grid in New York City versus San Francisco? And this new geoelectric field is going to provide that kind of information. Not on the magnetic field, but the actual electric field that develops so they can calculate the current mm -hmm. that's going to be introduced into their system, that DC current that they don't, don't want to have to deal with. This, is, this product is going to provide us. We envision this thing, this model, uh, running operationally 24-7 in uh, grid centers around this country. 
And in regard to the uh, the improvements there, what outreach has occurred to ensure that stakeholders are aware of uh, the development of the uh, opportunity? So fortunately, there's a within um, there's the North American Electric Reliability Corporation in Atlanta that are essentially responsible for in, to enforcing the standards that came from FERC. Within that NERC group, which involves all of industry, there is a GMD, a Geomagnetic Disturbance Task Force. We are a big part of that. Every meeting, which is about quarterly, we're in there updating them with this information and advising them when it's available and when it is available, we let them know when it was distributed to everyone. So we know it went to every grid electric power generation and transmission entity across this country and Canada. Thank you. And to both you, Mr. Murtaugh, and Admiral uh, Lautenbacher, what economic and social science research exists that might help us understand the potential impacts on different sectors of our economy in regard to the uh, economic and social research being done? So the, shall I? Okay, there, there was a, a, I think it was referenced once already, uh, NOAA sponsored a report recently from, it's online, it's published a couple of years ago, of the APT Associates was the company that did it, which was essentially, we asked them to find out, give us a sense of the economic impact, potential economic impact on the various sectors uh, from an extreme space weather event. Uh, so that document was released and someone referenced a $20 billion impact. That was a number associated with a grid outage, a nine-hour outage in, in a relatively small area in this country due to a geomagnetic storm. So that document's helped as a good reference, uh, a good, good reference material for us to use. Okay. Anything that you want to add to that, Admiral? No, that's the, that's the best thing that I know of that we have out there right now. Okay, and with the uh, space weather effects that uh, range from insignificant to highly disruptive to our communication systems, um, with the public and business uh, um, involvement, uh, should they prepare for such events uh, if they, are they informed in a way to uh, know how to respond to different events and how often do uh, different kinds of space weather events occur? So on the NOAA space weather scales, it's, it's a question that's so often asked, what, how often do they occur? So we did include it on there. And that one through five, where five is an extreme event, on a radiation storm, the, um, the uh, S scale, we haven't had one of them in, the, in 30 years. We, don't know, we started taking measurements in 1974. We haven't had one yet. Uh, on the G5 level, an extreme geomagnetic storm, typically we'll get one or two per cycle. I think the last one was in, in 2003. Uh, our, the sect industry and customers uh, are so wide ranging now, some of them quite sophisticated and understand this stuff, like satellite operators, many others not so much. Mm -hmm. Airlines uh, uh, would be a good example. So we do maintain close communications with those folks uh, to make sure that they understand what, they, uh, what they're getting when they get it. Okay. Um, my time is now exhausted, so I will yield back. Thank you very much. I'll now recognize Mr. Murphy for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I just want to say thank you uh, to the presenters. Your expertise and dedication um, to this field is exemplary, and uh, it's obvious. Uh, you know, one person made a comment a few minutes ago, I think it was Mr. Murtaugh, about talk about uh, individual weather. That's what most people care about. They want to look outside and see if they can have a picnic or go to a ball game. But it's, uh, it's under your responsibility, it's under our responsibility, really, to look at the bigger global picture. And um, so I thank you for that. It's an important thing that uh, doesn't have partisan back politics in its back pocket. It doesn't have national politics in its back pocket because uh, the earth is one place and it's affected globally by... Uh, by events that occur um, by the, in the sun. So uh, again, thank you for your dedication. It's really important really for us as a species, if it is. Um, just a couple questions. I now I'll be a lot more granular. I live uh, down on the east coast um, of North Carolina. Uh, my district probably has more coastline, uh, has more coastline than anybody else in North Carolina. So I want to um, I want to crack your, your brains on seeing if you can help me. Um, is there anything that we have as far as space weather prediction? You know, we have these things called hurricanes. 
and um, we don't like them in North Carolina, but they tend to come right to us. And so I didn't know if there's anything that you guys have, uh, you know, up your sleeve that help us in the future to be able to predict the intensity, predict the path, predict the uh, rainfall amounts that we can use to better gauge how these will affect us. Uh, yeah, and, and there's been a term we've been using at the operations center. We call it the money chart, <laughs> and that's what you're looking for, is, is something that uh, makes sense to, to people. Uh, but is it for, to identify when GPS may be having problems or when there's a potential grid problem? Um, we, we, we are absolutely focusing, and I mentioned it already with the, with the geo, geoelectric field model, focusing on trying to capture that key piece where will the impacts be felt? It's, we, 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 sh we should be past that point where we're advising the whole world something's going to happen, it's going to hit somewhere, maybe in South Africa, maybe in Scandinavia, maybe in New York City. We, we have got to be able to identify and, the, and help the folks in North Carolina understand when space weather might affect them. So we are getting there. We are in have introduced a new suite of models, sun to earth modeling system that's helping us just drill down and start, we're, we're years away, but we're getting, we have to start somewhere to get to that point where we can do just as you ask. Excellent, thank you. Uh, just one other question, you know, the United States, uh, um, we seem to be uh, leading in this regard. We, this is a global issue, it's a global phenomenon. Uh, how much funding does the United States uh, put in compared to other nations, and where are we in trying to get our global uh, partners to jump on the bandwagon and really participate this as an earthly event? Uh, so we have very close partnerships uh, with, with many of our overseas colleagues. Um, we actually uh, sort of work together on a lot of the missions. Um, for example, Solar Orbiter, which is an ESA mission, uh, has a couple of NASA instruments, but NASA is actually launching it for them. Um, we are also in talking to them about a possibility of an L5 mission. So Mr. Murtaugh mentioned the L1 point, which is a million miles away. L5 is kind of off to the side, so it lets you look at, at those sunspots coming round before they actually get to you. And so we're actually talking uh, very closely with them about that uh, we've talked to many of our, our agency, sister agencies in other countries, because really, as you note, space weather is a global problem. It doesn't just hit one place. You may be unlucky, and we happen to be at the midnight sector, which is that kind of worst place to be as things come rushing down um, on the night, the night side. But until we can really um, say it's going to be here at this time, and this is, this is the country that's in that, that little window, it's really a global problem. So we work very, very, very closely with all of our, our, our sister agencies to really make this a global solution. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back my time. Thank you very much. Um, I'd now recognize Mr. Christ for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank both the chairs for convening this hearing. Appreciate that very much. Um, it's sort of an overarching question to anybody who wants to answer it, and thank you all for being here, by the way. Um, what's the most dangerous aspect uh, for humans from space weather? So, so that really depends, honestly, on, on the system that you, you particularly care about. Um, for, a, for, for the human body, for our astronauts, that's why we really have to watch the space radiation, and we put a lot of investment and a lot of effort. Um, NASA's number one priority is the safety of our, of our astronauts. Um, down here on Earth, obviously we don't have to worry about that, but airline passengers, we watch the radiation for those. Um, power grids, we've already talked about, that becomes very critical if, you, if you're, suddenly it's a life and death situation where you're relying on that power grid to be up. So it really depends a little bit on your perspective, but for, for, for NASA, certainly it's the radiation effects on our astronauts. If I could just add to that, uh, the committee might be interested to know that the, within the United Nations, there's the International Civil Aviation Organization who have been working on this issue for over a decade now. And coming up next month, hot off the press, uh, will be a new uh, suite of space weather services that will be provided for global aviation, space weather services. And the ICAO group have identified three centers for the provision of these services, and the United States is one of the three. Thank you. The threat, of course, is um, communications, navigation, but also, as Dr. Fox mentioned, radiation exposure. When you fly over the poles, there is increased radiation that can cause some, some problems. Great. Admiral? I mentioned that there's also uh, uh, part of the uh, 
uh, commercial sector that produces sensors that people can wear and, and maintain and get immediate uh, connection as to whether with the ground to find out whether they're getting exposure that could be dangerous and how they can change the mission and that sort of thing. So these, these uh, inventions uh, that are out there now are going to be very helpful to the aviation world. Thank you very much. Thank you all. So radiation is the greatest concern, it sounds like. Just from human exposure, I mean, obviously Indeed. losing electric power f over a wide area for a long length of time would be a big, big concern. Certainly. Uh, what is the cause of the radiation in space? Is it solar spots or where? Yes? Uh, so the, the increased radiation usually is because of those sunspots that, f that we call it a flare, where you see that bright flash of light, and it accelerates particles at about half the speed of light. So they take eight minutes for light to travel from the sun to the earth. It's about 15 to 20 to 30 minutes. Those particles will start coming in. Um, however, that we, we, we live with our own radiation environment around us. We have the Van Allen radiation belts. They're two intense radiation belts. They kind of encircle the equator. Um, and, and we have a lot of spacecraft, space assets that actually have to travel through these belts. And, and sometimes when we get these big, big events, these belts can grow both in size and also in intensity. And so that can have a very big impact on the assets that are, that maybe they don't, they're not actually supposed to be in the radiation belts. And suddenly that radiation belt kind of grows and engulfs that spacecraft. Is it safe to say generally that our atmosphere protects humans on Earth for the most part from any radiation from the sun. Yes, we're very lucky from that, yes. I would say. <laughs> uh, and I guess probably my last question, Dr. Fox, to you. In your testimony, you note the potential for the Artemis program to further our knowledge of space weather and space radiation. Uh, it is my understanding that this is because the moon is well outside of the Earth's protective magnetic field. Um, what challenges or opportunities does the orbit of the Lunar Gateway present for heliophysics, particularly as it relates to space weather. So definitely lots and lots of opportunities. As you note, uh, the, the moon is sometimes protected when it's behind the, the Earth. It's, it's in our magnetosphere, so it's protected. But there are a lot of time when the, the moon is actually out in what we call the pristine solar wind, so this ex continually expanding atmosphere of the corona coming out and engulfing us. And so we really look forward uh, to being able to further our knowledge of, of what is in this solar wind um, and, and then apply that to um, our, our Artemis program as we go forward to the moon and Mars and beyond. Great, thank, thank you all three of you very much. Thank you, Madam Chairs. Thank you, I'll now recognize Mr. Perlmutter for five minutes. Thanks, Madam Chair and Bill, good to see you. Good to see you. Um, thank you all very much for your testimony today. I'll uh, be pretty brief, just a quick statement and then a couple questions. So. Uh, thank you for convening this hearing. Uh, I've been interested in space weather for some time now, and I'm excited the committee's uh, really looking at this closely. Colorado, uh, Mr. Murtaugh, uh, has some of the best minds, laboratories, and research institutions on space weather in the country. We have institutions like CU Boulder and the National Center for Atmospheric Research, as well as NOAA's Space Weather Prediction Center, among others. And that's why uh, Corey Gardner, senator from Colorado, is working with Gary Peters, uh, senator from Michigan, uh, on the Space Weather Research and Forecasting Act in the Senate. And it's why we've been encouraging the Science Committee to take up that legislation to help the academic community and the commercial sector best contribute and participate in our space weather enterprise. So to work with NOAA through this whole process and make sure we don't have silos, and, and you know, over the last couple of years, I can see that those silos have been really disappearing, which I just want to applaud you all so that we're not all just sort of not talking to each other. And uh, just since I was introduced to this subject, uh, clearly the communication lines uh, between the academics, the, the government, and the commercial sector have just improved uh, magnificently. The Senate Commerce Committee passed uh, an updated version of this legislation in April, and since that time I've been working with uh, Mo Brooks uh, to update that legislation with some additional provisions and move us closer to passing the bill into law. Our overarching goal through this legislation is to advance space weather research and forecasting enterprise, help solidify the swim lanes, who's actually doing what, but then really continue a robust uh, communication 
uh, between the different uh, groups. I want to thank uh, Mr. Brooks for his partnership on this issue and the committee staff for their expertise as we've been drafting this bill. We hope to release the text of the bill next week to get additional feedback from all of you, um, our colleagues, the agencies, and uh, uh, academia and the commercial sector. So, Admiral, I'd like to start with you. I, I see Mr. Murtaugh on a, uh, not a regular basis, but from time to time, I, you know, since I'm not too far away from uh, the, the Space Weather Center. So my question to you is, how, uh, what things do you think need to be done to improve the overall communication between the acad academic community, NOAA, and the commercial sector? And you've, you know, and then I'll ask you about military in just a second. We, we have to build a more robust system that combines what I would say meetings, uh, kind of, uh, uh, protocols to deal with, and we get used to the fact that we need to work together across from from uh, from government. And the the civilian side is is maybe a little more fractured because there are different companies, but we do have you know organizations that can bring together companies and can work with government agencies. It's very hard to work with a, take a government agency and work with uh, a group of companies, and and people generally. Yeah, that's too hard. I'm not going to work on this this one today. But we need we in this area we really need to stress ourselves and get to the point where we have those mechanisms. The mechanisms allow a phone call to be picked up and talk talk directly, and so that we can do rapid reaction, moving of the data, moving of the issues. Uh, the, the commercial sector is in good shape in a way because it 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 has folks all the way from basic research all the way up to emergency management to help in, in situations. So we would like to be involved in those kinds of conversations with, uh, and, and, and the, the bill could help us set up something that would be, I think, more robust than we have today. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Fox, what are your thoughts? So I, I first of all, would recognize the, the, the tremendous efforts that have really helped us from the National Space Weather Strategy and Action Plan, um, and they're really providing a forum for us to work really, really well together on, on really tough problems. Um, I mean, as you can probably note, uh, NOAA and NASA are working very, very closely together on the space weather um, piece itself, uh, taking all of our great research and then making sure that we really are transitioning it. Um, so I, I really think that that has just been a tremendous benefit. And I'll also note that, you know, at, at NASA, we've really embraced these, this idea of sort of rideshare programs. Um, there is now a rideshare policy that we have of making sure if there's something launching that we look for other opportunities to take more mass to space, get more science in space. Um, and that, of course, includes our commercial partners also. And so under the Artemis uh, program, we really are exploring even more the, uh, the commercial side. And then I'll just throw in, I know we're out of time, but under um, from our decadal survey, we were asked to do this drive initiative. And one of the big things was the science centers. And so that really does just provide this amazing forum for um, academia, government, industry, all working together, um, we're, we're excited. We've got 39 proposals. It's a nightmare to try and review them, but um, it's, it's, it's a product of our own success, so we're happy. All right, thank you. And Bill, I'll ask you my question when we're on the flight home. <laughs> I'll see. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, well, before we bring the hearing to a close, I want to thank all of you for your testimony here today. Um, I think it was really important, and I'm so glad that we were able to have this hearing. The record of the hearing will remain open for two weeks for additional statements from the members and for any additional questions um, that they may ask of you. And so I, I look forward to seeing your additional answers or should more questions be sent. And I think I saw my colleague, Ms. Horn, jotting one down. So I think y'all can all expect at least one. Um, but for now, you all are excused and the hearing is closed. Thank you so much.